Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this exclusive Waste 360 webinar sponsored by Van Dyke Recycling Solutions. My name is Mallory Schapansky, I'm the Editorial Director for Waste 360 and the moderator of this webinar. Before we begin, a few words about this webinar technology. This platform allows our audience to be more involved with the presentation, and more importantly, allows you to watch this event the way you want to watch it. To begin, feel free to customize your webcast console. You can move windows around by dragging on the title bar or resize your windows by clicking on the lower right corner of any window. You'll also notice a toolbar at the bottom of your console. These buttons allow you to open and close widgets on your screen. You may also submit questions at any time and they will be answered at a later date by Van Dyke. We also invite you to get social. If at any time during our session today, you hear something interesting, feel free to tweet it to your followers using the Twitter widget. If at any time you experience difficulties with the audio or advancing of the slides, simply press your F5 key to refresh your webinar console. You can also download the slides for this webinar by clicking on the folder icon on your screen. You can do this during the webinar and it will not interrupt the presentation. We also appreciate your feedback, so please click on the red survey icon and complete the form. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters. Mark Knightsey is the Director of Sales for Van Dyke. Mark has been involved in more than 100 recycling equipment projects in the last 15 years, from simple bailing sites to mega MRFs and system retrofits. Mark travels throughout North America, visiting plants and gaining a broad perspective on the industry and its current trends. Joining Mark is Adam Lovewell, Sales Manager for the Midwest for Van Dyke. Adam has almost a decade's experience in project engineering and construction management for projects along solid waste and recycling. He is constantly evaluating industry trends and their potential for long-term influence. And with that, we will begin the presentation. Hi, I'm Mark Knightsey, the Sales Director for Van Dyke Recycling Solutions. Today, I'm here with Adam Lovewell, our Midwest process engineer, and we're going to present MRFs in Crisis. Van Dyke consults and sells equipment to help recycling processors maximize their profits. We design, build, sell, and supply service support for residential single stream sorting systems throughout North America. Our team travels around touring facilities and talking to processors all over the country. We're not operators, but we do meet with expert operators in different parts of North America on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're advocates for these operators. And China has affected them big time in the last six months. Uh, the extreme high quality specs that MRFs suddenly need to be able to meet to sell their material. Uh, the massive influx and growing supply of incoming material with dramatically lower demand and fewer outlets to sell the finished product has really shined a light on the struggles that single stream MRFs have been facing for years, actually. We're going to talk about a few of these struggles today. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about terribly contaminated inbound streams. Oh, by the way, that's a nice picture that Adam found of me there with those BCG glasses on. Uh, we're gonna talk about contaminated inbound material. Did you guys know that one in four things that go into a recycling bin is not a recyclable? Think about that for a minute. 25% of the recyclables are not recyclable. And some of this contamination coming into the MRF has huge negative impact on processing and quality. Now, the second thing we're going to talk about is labor issues. Sorter jobs at a MRF are some of the worst jobs imaginable, let's face it. Uh, and there's a small pool of candidates that are willing to do this work. And now with e-verification and mandatory drug screening, it's even more difficult to find and retain capable people to do the job. The third thing is aging equipment with changing material composition. We're processing a completely different 2018 inbound stream 
but we're using 2008 or 2006 aging equipment. The stream is changing, the evolving ton, the light weighting, the reduced amount of newspaper, the increased amount of cardboard, uh, those are all factors. Uh, then lastly, we're gonna kind of summarize and talk through what we can do about this. And we're gonna highlight those three and talk through some things we can do moving forward. Okay, let's get started. Adam, you want to Thanks, take Mark. away inbound material? Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that introduction. Uh, so, yeah, so I guess we're going to start off with inbound material. Uh, and the reason why this material has just gone downhill uh, so quickly, as Mark stated before, one in four items, 25% uh, upwards, even higher, uh, of the material entering into the facility uh, are non-target recyclables for the MRF. Uh, so, you know, the question is, is why is all this material ending up there? Well, a couple of the reasons for that is this, this new phrase that's coming out, wish cycling. Uh, so that's basically, you know, you've kind of heard people maybe say the phrases, you know, I'm not really sure, but they'll figure it out. Uh, or it has a recycling logo on it, so it must go in the bin. Uh, a lot of these factors, you know, contribute to that 25% contamination uh, and it's really causing an issue here at the plants. A lot of the items that are coming into these plants are just wacky items. Um, you know, big pieces of plastic, bulky plastic, bulky metals. Uh, and when you talk to a lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of the consumers, um, you know, really what they tell you is, well, it's metal. Uh, so it must go, you know, it's recyclable or it's plastic. Uh, so it, it should go in the bin. Um, you might even hear, you know, people talking about electronics, you know, they've heard that there are electronic scrap facilities that do recycling. Um, a lot of items that we see ending up that are issue items in the plant are cross-contaminated items. That means it's uh, part metal, part plastic, um, but where does it go? You know, where does it get mixed into? So we're seeing a lot of those wacky items ending up in the system that require both manual labor uh, to get them out of there, um, and they cause a lot of damage to equipment in the system. One of the biggest things that we see as an issue in these plants uh, that we're gonna talk about later is film, uh, film plastic. And what we hear from folks a lot is, well, my program accepts it, so it's going in the bin. Uh, or that's how I carry my recyclables, so how else am I supposed to get the recyclables in my house out to the curb? Uh, so we're gonna go through some of those things, and next I'm gonna show you some examples, some pictures uh, of, of material around the country. Uh, these pictures actually have been taken within the last year, um, and it just sheds light on some of the things that we're seeing and that I'm sure you guys are seeing uh, at these facilities. This first picture is of bulky metals uh, being pulled out from pre-sort. So this material, as you can see in this picture, consists of um, bulky metal materials, uh, fans, siding from houses, um, metal grating, tires, uh, electronics. A lot of this stuff enters into the system and there's no automated way to recover this material. So what it requires is manual sorting, hazardous manual sorting. You can imagine as uh, the materials going down the line, having to reach over and grab these items off the line is not only strenuous, uh, it's dangerous. So these materials are pulled off of pre-sort um they're thrown down into a bunker yeah uh, if hey Adam, hard. i would like to interject that uh you know sometimes wacky metals like this are so small difficult to see on pre-sort a lot of times like brake parts or pots and pans which could really damage or jam up a screen and cause some downtime they're so small difficult to see when you're doing a high volume inbound on a pre-sort yeah, Mark, that's a really good point. You know, you, you hear, you can hear it in plants when you're hanging out there for a little while is, you know, you'll hear something enter the system and then you'll just hear it banging as it goes from conveyor to conveyor, or just from screen to conveyor, just around the plant. Uh, and it could be a small motor uh, or brake disc. Uh, and as that, that, that item, uh, as it's buried underneath the other paper and containers, uh, makes its way throughout the plant, it damages equipment. Uh, so very hazardous items to the system and to the sorters. The next thing we see a lot in plants are a couple things, textiles, uh, electrical cords, hoses. 
these items, uh, long stringy items, uh, just get wrapped everywhere. Um, so, you know, a hose that might have been brand new right out of the package that somebody was wish cycling uh, threw into their bin. And then as that material opens up inside the system, it just gets wrapped everywhere. So the picture that's shown here is of a drum feeder. Uh, it's a metering device at the beginning of the system to meter material uh, through the system. It's attracting all of the stringy items. Uh, so it attracts all the textiles and the ropes and the cords. Uh, and then as you can see in the bottom left-hand picture, there's actually a operator uh, outside of the ship cleaning all this material off of that drum feeder. Yeah, look, there's also a couple other things that I'm hearing. One is seasonal, but Christmas lights get put into the recycling bin and they wrap around everything. And the other one is people are throwing out their old, they're cleaning out their attics and they're throwing out their old VCRs and VHS tapes. And that tape breaks and the ribbon really causes havoc on the system, wraps around every bearing, and it is very difficult and very harmful to a system. There's so many VC8, VHS tapes uh, in the stream now, it's really a problem. Yeah, Mark, and what we've seen from some of the facilities that as that, that VHS tape, uh, as it wraps around the bearing on some of these conveyors, and some of the screens, uh, it causes a lot of friction, and that's where we start seeing things start to smolder uh, and even fires. Uh, there have been a couple of screens inside of these systems uh, and conveyors that have caught fire from uh, even just these stringy materials like the VHS tape being caught uh, inside the bearings. Uh, one of the next items that we see a lot are wire hangers. Uh, just, you know, a simple thing. Uh, it's all metal. You know, it's one item. It's not, you know, cross-contaminated item. Um, people think that it, it should go in the bin because it's metal, uh, but it's not a container. Uh, so these systems aren't necessarily designed to handle uh, these type of uh, materials. You know, they, they tend to attract uh, a lot of the other stringy materials, uh, a lot of the plastic bags, and then they just form bundles uh, inside the system and they get jammed in transitions between conveyors, they get jammed in screens, and just cause a significant amount of downtime uh, where their value of them having being in the system, it, it's just not there. One of the other items that we see inside the system, and it pretty much shows up at every single MRF, uh, bulky rigid plastics. So as you can see in the picture, there are laundry baskets, uh, kitty litter containers, uh, totes for trash and recycling. You see a lot of coolers. Um, these items, are uh, added into the bin, uh, they're brought to the MRF, and then they're recovered at pre-sort. So, you know, the pre-sort is dedicated for, you know, it's required to have sorters there to remove items such as these. Uh, they do have a value um, in the marketplace, but if not recovered up front on the pre-sort, they make their way down the stream, just like the bulky metals and other stringy items, and they get jammed in equipment and cause downtime. You also end up seeing like little tyke plastic toys, high chairs, toilet seats, um, wide range of stuff. The next item that we see a lot of, and it, it's not really, it doesn't cause issues uh, at the facility um, other than a contamination to your glass product if you have glass in your program. Uh, are just small items. Uh, your typical MRF will have a glass breaking screen or a fine screen. Uh, we'll talk later about ballistic separators that, that screen out uh, a small fraction of the system. Uh, but essentially, anything that is less than two inches in size in a, any dimension uh, is screened from the system. So as you can see in this picture, uh, it consists of glass, shredded paper, grit, uh, small plastic bottles, medicine bottles, uh, a lot of plastic caps, a lot of, uh, you know, metal caps from beer bottles or soda bottles, um, and then just a lot of miscellaneous items, pens and pencils and straws and forks and knives. Uh, and all of this material uh, is kind of that wish cycling. You know, people see plastic, they see metal, they think it should go in the bin, uh, but in actuality, it's, 
it's not. Uh, a lot of this material as it's screened out uh, is just recovered as a residue or it goes with the glass uh, and then contaminates the glass product. And I would say that, is it recyclable? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. But does it make economic sense? Because you're going to end up adding technology uh, to separate this out and that the capital starts to uh, be high based on what could really be recovered there. So that's really um, challenging the two inch minus. The next item I want to show here is just an example of some more confusion that's going on uh, as a consumer. Um, this is a, uh, a picture on the left. It's a case of water uh, wrapped in uh, flexible packaging. Um, the inside bottles are all PET water bottles. Great. We all want to see these showing up at the Merck. Uh, but when you flip the packaging over, the case over, uh, as highlighted in the picture on the right, circled in red, uh, it shows the recycling symbol, and then it says, please recycle. Uh, well, as a consumer, what am I supposed to think about this? Is it the packaging that's recyclable? Is it the bottles that are inside that are recyclable? Uh, am I just supposed to throw everything in the bin? Uh, what am I supposed to do with that? So there's a lot of confusion out there as a consumer uh, as this recycling logo is thrown around um, onto anything that could be recyclable. A lot of confusion lies in uh, packaging that is claiming just as this, that the inside content is recyclable uh, or the packaging is recyclable. An example of that would be uh, an ink cartridge for your printer. Comes in a cardboard box, uh, has a recycling uh, symbol on the outside of the box, and what are you supposed to do with it? Well, the box should go in your single stream bin or uh, your dual stream bin, and then the inside content, that uh, ink cartridge, it is recyclable, but not in a single stream operation or a dual stream operation. Those items are supposed to go back to stores like Best Buy where they can recover those, uh, but, but there's just a, a very high level of confusion as to what items are supposed to go in a single stream bin uh, or taken back to a store. Yeah, so as we segue from wish recycling to the film, this is a picture of the sticker on top of a, a single stream cart in Frederick, Maryland. This is actually taken from Adam's. I think, Adam, this is from your father's house, I think. Yeah, yeah, he took that picture. Um, so this was given, this bin was given to him seven years ago and uh, circled in the on the sticker is film bags, clearly part of the program, along with the other items there. Um, it's a little busy, but it is uh, clear in what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Now, that doesn't mean that the MRF that this goes to is able to handle these effectively. And that's kind of what we're gonna um, lean into now, which is the film bag epidemic. The film bag epidemic is basically, it's a huge problem. It's a huge uh, problem for most facilities. Let's back up a little bit. Film bags are usually not part of the input composition that us as system suppliers usually see when we're designing a system. We usually get an inbound composition uh, that says something like residue, a certain amount of percentage, or trash, a certain amount of percentage. Um, and it never really specifies film bags as their own separate category. So we did um, a system recently in Dallas. Uh, it's a 35 ton an hour system. And during the startup, over the course of several months, we took daily audits of the inbound stream. And we were shocked to find four and a half percent of the inbound stream to that facility is film bags. Um, and we're just gonna go through the math here. If you did 35 ton an hour, four and a half percent, that's 3,150 pounds per hour of film bags. We then weighed 
how many bags it took to equal a pound. That number is 75. If you take 75 bags to equal a pound, that means over 236,000 bags per hour go into that system. If the average sorter picks 40 picks a minute, and let's face it, everyone on this call has probably seen sorters do more than 40 picks a minute, but I know we've all seen them do less, so let's just use that as an average. They can get 2,400 bags per hour. That means, and we've always said as an industry, you got to get the film out on pre-sort, you got to get the film out on pre-sort. They would need 98 sorters to capture all of the film on pre-sort, 98. And that's if they were only sorting film. That is staggering. Now, there's probably some people uh, listening to the webinar that maybe have a lower amount of film in their input stream uh, or a smaller system. So if you ran the math on 1% of film in your inbound stream and you had a smaller system, 25 ton an hour, you still need 22 sorters dedicated to only sorting film on the pre-sort. We would highly recommend doing some input studies of your own to see just how much film you have. I think you'll be shocked with the numbers. And uh, it's really a cause, um, it's really a cause for systems to struggle, as you will see shortly. Yeah, Mark, I just want to mention that the, uh, the picture here of the roll-off uh, on the right side, uh, it's all film. Uh, and what that is, is uh, after that's a, a day shift, uh, and that's the, the cleaning that goes on uh, in the system, pulling bags out of screens and conveyors, uh, and that's where it ends up. Uh, it's all manually removed. Uh, it's not ending up in product or recovered by the sorters. Uh, it ends up in the equipment. So what's shown in that picture is essentially a day's worth of film uh, that was pulled out of equipment uh, in the system. Yeah, there's, there is a lot of negative consequences to film uh, in, a, in a single stream system. And I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Maybe, Adam, you can share a few too. The first one that comes to mind is the screen gets clogged and starts to act as a conveyor. So when that happens, bottles and cans start to convey over the screen and go into the paper. So in essence, high-valued plastic bottles and aluminum cans are now in low-valued paper and need to be hand-sorted out. So the screening is lost. The effect of that screen is totally lost by uh, film clogging. So then you go in to clean that screen, and we've got operators that say they clean anywhere from one hour to four hours a day dedicated to just cleaning those screens with two, three, four um, people at a time. Think about the lost production there if you've got four hours worth of cleaning to be done. And it happens dedicated cleaning time. It happens at lunch. It happens at every break. Usually you see people in the screen doing massive amounts of cleaning. Um, and that's, quite frankly, it's a safety issue because they're climbing on the screen. Yes, they're harnessed, but they're climbing on a screen, uh, walking on a moving axle, not using knives to cut out stuff. Um, and quite frankly, it doesn't always help because you go back and watch 20 minutes after they've cleaned and it's back to being blinded. So it loses its effect very, uh, very quickly. Yeah, Mark, and just to, just to add to that, uh, as you can see on the picture on the right uh, with the screen, actually both of them, but more clearly on the right, uh, you can see how much material, uh, and it's not just film, there's also uh, Christmas lights there on the bottom of the picture and uh, some kind of cordage there in the middle of the picture. Um, but as you can see, one of the other um, issues with the wrapping uh, is the longevity of the stars. Uh, so as one shaft, builds up with material, uh, the neighboring shaft uh, that has the stars uh, in, that, in that space, uh, the material builds up so much that it ends up rubbing against the star of the neighboring shaft. Uh, so when you talk about the life of stars, 
uh, it starts to significantly decrease as that material uh, is rubbing against those stars. So a lot of times people think that the abrasiveness of the bottles and the cans and the glass uh, is contributing to uh, the wear on the stars, which it does. Uh, but when you have instances like this, uh, that you let the wrapping go, you know, throughout the duration of the shift, we've seen it ends like this, or uh, we've also seen, you know, people letting it go for multiple days, you'll lose those stars very quickly. I mean, I'm talking, you know, if you, if you let it go like this, you're changing stars, you know, every two or three months, um, you know, and on a regular basis, if you're changing stars at all. Uh, one of the other things that we've seen too, this causes fires. Uh, we've seen screens catch on fire uh, because of this rubbing. You're rubbing plastics together, you're getting that friction going, it creates heat. Uh, a lot of the stringy items like the VHS tapes that Mark had mentioned before get wrapped up in here and in the bearings and that heat uh, then sparks a fire and you have a fire in your screen. Um, so just a, a really big issue uh, in these systems with uh, film and, and stringy materials. Yeah, so this next slide shows what has to happen at every MRF going forward. Uh, because of the high stringent specifications of the end product, bail dressing goes on, and you, you have to be able to pass the site test uh, to be able to ship your material. A lot of that film would be flapping in the wind if it wasn't removed. So uh, the picture on the the two pictures on the right show a bale, and that ended up being an 800 pound sample. Uh, and the picture next to that is the film removed from that 800 pound sample. So that bale uh, dressed up, you don't see any film in it. Um, we did a bale audit and that's how much film was still in that stream after sorting. Um, it's yeah, Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the uh, in that bale sample, uh, in the 800 pounds was four pounds of rigid containers um, and miscellaneous trash. Uh, the rest of it was film. So four pounds, and you do the math there, four pounds in an 800 sample, that's half a percent. That's China quality right there. But the film in that sample uh, put it upwards of, of the 3%, um, you know, which is outside of that spec. So, uh, you know, really a cause for concern to, to get that material um, sorted out of that, uh, out of that fiber product. So in, in summary on film, it is a recyclable. It is recyclable, but it does take a lot of technology to properly remove it and separate it. Um, and that just takes a lot of capital to do. Um, and it's, it's a major factor for MRFs uh, in today's climate. So the next topic we're gonna get into is labor issues. Uh, we all know that this is a big concern in the industry uh, and really, you know, as, uh, as Mark had mentioned earlier, we are uh, equipment suppliers uh, and service technicians, so we're not necessarily operating the plant and dealing with them, but as Mark mentioned, we do uh, visit a lot of facilities around the country and meet with a lot of the top uh, processors and you know, talk through some of their opinions and their, their tactics and ways to uh, train and keep a workforce um, you know, that wants to do the job uh, and then wants to do it well. So I'm just gonna go through and highlight a couple of those things. Uh, and the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, top-down directive. So what I mean by that is uh, everybody needs to understand what their job is and what the goals of the facility are. And that really starts with management. Uh, so being involved in webinars such as these or going to conferences or uh, talking with other MRF operators or uh, your equipment suppliers, uh, and really getting an understanding of, you know, how your system functions, what the goals are of your facility, what type of products you're trying to create, uh, and then understanding what your material composition is like. Uh, so as Mark mentioned before, doing audits of the material coming in, uh, and then audits of your products that you're creating, 
uh, really help to understand what the targets and goals are uh, for your operators and your sorters. So the way that it works is management uh, comes up with the ideas and the directions. You then relay that to your operators, uh, your plant staff, which includes you know, maybe your plant manager, your operations manager, um, your line leads, and then downward directed to the sorters. And one of the main topics that we discuss all the time with people is sorting priority. So which items to sort first? Uh, you know, we'll give you an example of that. If you're on the uh, fiber QC line uh, and you have both film and containers on there, uh, it's typically PET, lightweight PET and aluminum. Uh, which one do you tell your sorters to sort first? Uh, or are you telling them to sort browns? Um, you know, which ones are they supposed to focus on? What's the priority and target goals? Uh, and then are your line leads or your operators enforcing that on a regular basis? Uh, the next topic is videos. Um, you know, really understanding uh, how these systems operate and what the goals are of the facility uh, and going through training with both your operators and your sorting staff uh, and showing videos of how the system operates. You know, there are a lot of good videos online. Uh, I know that both uh, Van Dyke and a lot of our other uh, equipment suppliers share videos, uh, both on LinkedIn uh, and on YouTube. Um, and it just really gives a good explanation and a really simple explanation as to how these systems function, even if it's not your own plan, uh, giving these guys an understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it uh, really helps them focus on their jobs. The last topic I want to talk about uh, for training is signage. Um, just a really important uh, way to inform uh, your operators and your sorting staff and visitors uh, as to what's going on in the facility and what they're supposed to be doing. So the picture that I show here uh, is in a break room at a facility um, and it's just using uh, simple signage to help the sorting staff understand uh, what the what the materials are that they're focusing on. Um, you can see for the HDPE, um, you know, your standard person doesn't really know what HDPE is but they know what a Tide uh, laundry detergent container is, uh, and that would be... Yeah, they don't know the numbers either, Adam. They don't know the numbers either. Yeah, that's a good point. They don't know the numbers. So when you have, you know, a lot of places will use signage, but they might put up on the, uh, the bin that they're supposed to be sorting in, number five, and they might put PP next to it or polypropylene. Uh, number five, um, you know, how is somebody supposed to know exactly what a number five is supposed to be. Um, so putting the signage up at the plants really helps the sorters to understand uh, and be reminded of what they're supposed to be focusing on. So here's an example of actually inside the MRF uh, of where the signage, it's the same signage uh, that was used in the break room. So they're using uh, the same verbiage, the same pictures, uh, and the same color coordination um, to help them uh, and help the sorters uh, remember what they're supposed to be sorting into the bins. A lot of times plant operators will move people around into different positions or there'll be a high turnover rate with labor uh, and people are constantly coming in. This is just a way to create continuity um, throughout the plant and through throughout changes in, uh, in shift. Another form of signage uh, that we like to see out there and that uh, a lot of our operators have told us really helps with the system uh, is for cleaning uh, and routine maintenance. You know, the sorter's job isn't always just to sort material, uh, but while there's downtime in the plant, either, you know, there's a, a pause in the system or, you know, a jam in the system, uh, there's downtime that occurs or immediately after the shift is over, uh, there are routine daily maintenance activities, uh, cleaning activities that the sorters are supposed to be doing. So putting up signage uh, for people inside the plant, like the example on the left is for a container line, uh, it shows you there the daily activities that are supposed to be done. Uh, so this would be, you know, after the, uh, after the, shift, is, the shift is completed, um, these are some of the things that the, uh, the sorters that are dedicated to that or the maintenance team are supposed to go through. And that's their checklist. It wasn't just told to them during the briefing when they first got the job uh, or sitting on a piece of paper in their office. This is out there right on the platform for them to see every day. 
Uh, and then there's a list of, you know, if there's a downtime, what you're supposed to be doing. You know, a lot of times we see in the plants when there's an alarm that goes off that the sorters will just kind of hang out and talk to each other or read a magazine or be on their phone. Uh, these are some of the things that they can just be reminded of to do uh, during those times. Very clear. It's very clear. Everyone has clear responsibilities on what to do. Yep. So the next part of labor is retaining the labor that you work so hard to bring in. So you finally got the person in the plant, uh, you got them hired, you got them all set up, but then how do you keep them there? You know, it's what we, what we hear a lot from guys is how do you keep an employee uh, at the plant motivated, showing up on time and doing their job well every single day? So what I've heard from a couple folks is just incentives. You know, incentivizing uh, both your sorters, you can do this with your sorters, you can do it with your operators, you can do it with your maintenance staff, um, but, you know, really the sorters who are your, you know, they're doing the pre-sort to save your equipment, they're the last line of defense uh, for, you know, the paper quality, but at the end of the day, you know, what do they really care if you're not meeting, you know, the specification for your paper, or if, you know, a chain or something got through and jammed the system, they all of a sudden get a half an hour break if a uh, piece of equipment goes down. So how do you keep them motivated to do the job that they're doing, show up on time and do it well? So one of the ideas is incentives. So providing them some type of incentive to do the job, and that can be based on attendance, showing up every day, uh, uptime of the facility, so if you're, um, say, at, you know, for example, 85% uptime and you want to be at 90%, you could tell the sorters, hey, if you guys over the next two weeks get the average from 85 up to, say, we can even start it at 88, raise it 3%, we'll have a pizza lunch on that following Friday. You know, maybe you have to order a dozen, a dozen pies for the team. Ask yourself the question. So that is... Um, that really lends the need to know what your operating costs are and what 1% additional uptime is valued to you. Uh, and then it, it becomes clear. Uh, the numbers are staggering. Uh, if you can improve your uptime, a few pizza pies is nothing. Um, so little pieces like that, uh, gift cards or uh, other incentives, uh, company shirts or hats or swag, little things like that could go a long way to improving, major improving your operating cost per ton. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. And, you know, it's really, it's a win-win situation. Uh, what you let everybody know is, you know, you put the target goals up, uh, you let everybody know, you know, what the situation is, and then you just say, hey, if you meet it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. You know, you want to start with obtainable goals. You know, maybe you only make it 1% to start and then you start increasing it uh, or you come up with other types of goals. But you want to set them up with something where they can feel that they're succeeding, that they're successful. Uh, everybody wants a goal. Everybody wants a target to feel good at at the end of the day that they reached it, you know, and something to strive for on a daily basis. So like Mark mentioned, you know, it could be pizza, it could be gift cards, but uh, really at the end of the day, understanding you know, what those uh, incremental percentages of uptime will do to you uh, is really important. So the other factor that we see a lot for helping to retain employees is just to create a comfortable environment for them to work in. As we all know, this, these plants are not the, the, the most fun and enjoyable jobs to do. Um, you know, it's not a high paying job, but it is a very strenuous job. Uh, there's a lot of tolls that this takes on the body. You know, if we're trying to get them to do, you know, 40 to 60 picks a minute, you know, an industry average of maybe 50, uh, 50 picks a minute for, you know, multiple hours uh, between breaks, that's a lot of work. So, you know, a lot of times we see uh, these plants, um, they get very cold in the winter, uh, they get very hot in the summer. Uh, and it just, it kills production uh, out of your sorter when they're too cold to work or they're too hot to work. Uh, right now, you know, in the Midwest where I am, some of these plants, uh, it's upwards of 95 degrees uh, when you're standing on that plant. And when you're sorting 
at 40 picks a minute, you know, all day, every day, uh, it, it really takes a toll on people. Another idea uh, to help with the comfort is just think about the ergonomics. Uh, think about a sorter standing at his position, his or her position, uh, having to lean over a belt, um, you know, and depending on their height, uh, they might be stretching uh, to get over there, or the sorter might be too tall for that position. Uh, but thinking about, you know, the ergonomics of it, as shown on the picture on the right, just a simple thing is a pool noodle, you know, that, uh, that one of the sorters cut right in half, and they put it alongside of the conveyor, so as they're leaning over the conveyor, that uh, rigid side of the, uh, of the steel conveyor isn't rubbing up against them. So things like these, you know, these pool noodles or uh, uh, platforms for the uh, sorters to stand on, and then maybe even ergonomic, uh, the, the cushion platforms uh, or pads uh, for them to stand on. We all go to trade shows, you know, we all stand in the booths or stand out on the floor and, you know, standing on a steel or concrete floor uh, for hours at a time just puts so much strain on your legs and your back and your neck and your shoulders, uh, and then you just lose production uh, from your sorters when they get tired. And lighting is a big issue too. So Mark, I think you have a story about lighting. Yeah, I got a good example on lighting. Look, there's a plant I was calling on that I felt was like walking into a dungeon. It was the darkest facility I'd ever been in. Almost no lights were working and they still had 20 people up on the line sorting. Uh, a new plant manager came in and changed out the fixtures to be LED. Uh, was initial cost was high, but over time it would save electricity. And it was a night and day difference. It really lit up the entire facility. And man, you could just tell it was a huge morale booster. Um, so stuff like clean, you know, occasional major cleaning or improving of light, little things like that go a long way uh, with comfort for sorters. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, aging equipment. The research that we have conducted says that there's around 350 single stream MRFs in operation in North America, plus or minus, but uh, 350 is a good number to use. The majority of these were either built or retrofitted, meaning they were a dual stream system and they were retrofitted to single stream um, somewhere between 2003 and 2013. And at that time, they were built for the required tonnage that they needed at that time and for the type of material that they were getting in at that time. A lot of those systems at the time were using uh, bins and they've since switched to carts and that's caused the volume of inbound material to skyrocket. And then as we know, the material has changed. And that leads us to the next slide, which is we really are the true definition of insanity. We're operating a 2006 system with 2018 input material. Because of the evolving ton, light weighting, the Amazon effect, uh, the drastic reduction of ONP, um, the stream has just changed. And th these systems that were put in 10 and 15 years ago, some of them have two and three and four different devices known as news or ONP separation devices because the news used to be 50% of the streams, not that case anymore. Uh, another stat to throw out is PET drinking bottles. It used to take 17 bottles to equal one pound. Today it takes 40 water bottles to equal one pound. So the number of bottle bottles have gone up and so has the percentage of PET. So the stream is, is really changing. So look, if you're young and you're on this webinar, you might not know what this is, but this is called newspaper. It used to be really prevalent about five or six years ago. Uh, so these are a couple pictures. Picture on the left is inbound single stream. Uh, if you look at that, it's very heavily in news. Picture on the right is actually a, a newspaper screen, having newspaper carry over the screen and bottles and cans bounce back. Uh, boy, it would be nice to be like the good old days. Um, in essence, 
It's hello, Amazon effect, goodbye, newspaper. So these next two slides really give you a visual of what has happened in the last 10 years. So if you look closely, this is a slide from a system taken in 2008. If you look at the conveyor on the right, train your eye on that. Now, take a look at the same system, 2018. That's the same in-feed. Uh, it's taken from a different angle, but it's exactly the same. So if we toggle back and forth, you can see the 2008 picture and the 2018 picture. That really tells the status of the changing stream for sure. Yeah, Mark, if you look at it, you know, looking in this picture right here, as you mentioned before, you know, large volumes of the newspaper. Um, it's even hard to really pick out where containers are. It's just pretty much all uh, newspaper, mixed paper, some small cardboard, uh, you know, and that's that's what it, the, the composition is. Uh, but then when you switch it over to 2018, uh, it's gone. Um, you know, you, uh, you just don't see that fluffy newspaper anymore. What you see is the small browns, uh, you know, heavy amount of small browns. Uh, a lot of small mixed paper, uh, a lot of containers, um, and then uh, then just a lot of trash. Uh, so like a lot you of said, fines and trash. Yeah, the newspaper is yeah. just gone. All right, so this is a national average of the input material going into a single stream MRF in 2018. Just touching on a couple of them, uh, it's just the OCC percentage is at 29 and a half. I bet if you were on this webinar and you're involved in a in a contract or a system, if you go back and look at what was it stated that your municipality had for inbound OCC, most inbound compositions would say 10% OCC or 15% OCC. Look, the national average is now 29 and a half. And we would argue from the audits that we have done for customers, both doing the inbound audit and then out auditing the outbound, and the mixed paper has so much outros in it, that number is actually closer to 35% inbound OCC now. Uh, the other number to take issue with is the PET number. This is a national average, says it's almost 2%, but in a non-bottle bill state, we have seen PET be as high as 5% in the inbound stream. 5% inbound PET, has big effects on uh, on a system that would maybe alter the sizing of an optical sorter. It would maybe call for um, another screening device or a pre-screening device because that uh, we'd already talked earlier about because of light weighting. There's so many more pieces when PT gets closer to five percent. It's by volume. It's a dramatic number. And Mark, take a look at the numbers down on the bottom left between glass, residue, and mixed paper. I know it's a, a sensitive topic for, for a lot of people on the call and a lot of people in the industry, but if you take, we'll just, we'll just keep it easy with the math, 20% glass, 20% residue, 20% mixed paper, glass could go for, for zero or negative, residues go for negative, and mixed paper could go for zero or negative. So 60% of the stream right now is essentially, you know, in most cases or a lot of cases, zero or negative. Um, but it, what would be really great is that whole gray piece of the pie right there that is residue. Uh, if we could shrink that up, um, you know, all the other numbers increase. Uh, you know, you, you might not necessarily be getting more of the other material. Your volume might stay the same, uh, but your processing costs would go down significantly. That's a really good point, Adam. So the last thing to kind of touch on with aging equipment is you're in a contract, it might be a 15 or 20 year contract and you're halfway into it. You, you, you can only control what you can control, which is the equipment that you have at that time. And we have operators that have effective, proactive, routine preventative maintenance programs. Preventative maintenance days. We have several facilities that take an entire day during the week. They, they schedule their week of processing to allow for a Wednesday to become maintenance and PM day. 
That way maintenance and PMs aren't happening Sunday night at midnight or Saturday night at midnight. You're not burning out your staff. That's also when the parts that you might need are readily available or Granger is open. Um, it's the right time to do, if you can carve out during the day to really take a proactive approach to preventative maintenance. Uh, beyond that, simple changing stars or disks and having a star or disk uh, changing program. It's a, it's no different than your tires wearing out on your car. It's something that has to be done in a routine fashion over time. And it greatly affects uh, quality of the material, but it also greatly affects recovery. The next Mark, one is it's really change. it's really oh. everything with the with the stars and the discs. You know, if you don't change those stars and they are worn out and they're not doing the job that they're supposed to be doing, it negatively impacts the entire rest of the system. If you're not screening out the paper that you're supposed to be screening, uh, you know, and you're sending it downstream, it gets into your container line. Uh, if you're manually sorting containers, it's harder to see the containers. If you're uh, using optical sorters to sort the containers, a lot of that uh, light sheet paper is blown in with your product and you either have to quality control it or you're you know, ending up with a lower quality product. And like you mentioned, if the discs are worn out uh, and you have a lot of wrapping occurring on your screen, it turns into a conveyor and you're putting bottles and cans into your products. So it really has a negative impact when you don't uh, have regular uh, star changes and disc maintenance. No, I totally agree. So does making sure that your optical sorter has properly working lamps and uh, that the valves on the uh, valve block, the pneumatic air valve block are, are all working. That's the equivalent of without lamps, it's like sorting in the dark or sorting with your blindfold on. Um, this is very important. Yeah, it just doesn't work. You know, if you have what we find a lot is, uh, you know, the valves, there are a lot of valves in, in the optical sorters. Uh, and, a, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you have to, you know, your maintenance team has to be trained to do. Um, and uh, what we see is uh, when a valve gets stuck, uh, it'll get stuck typically uh, in the open position, uh, and then it just blows air. So uh, you're having material go down the belt, and anything that passes over that valve is essentially getting shot on. So if you're trying to shoot PET, uh, and you have a couple stuck valves in the open position on your valve block, anything that passes over that valve block, whether it's PET or not, is getting blown into your PET. So as Mark said, you know, having a, uh, a routine, um, you know, maintenance program and then having uh, your maintenance team and your operators continuously walk around the plant on a daily basis, on a shift basis. And if you see an optical sorter that has stuck valves or burnt, laps, burnt lamps, it immediately goes on the priority list to change and it should be done immediately. Yeah, totally agree. But the last thing to talk about is maintenance training overall. Um, a lot of times you will train up your best technician. He will be a hydraulic expert for the baler. He'll be an electrical expert for your PLC and he might know the most about the optical sorter. And then he'll leave you for a different industry or for a competitor. Cannot stress enough, continuous training, cross training, developing continuity folders, uh, making sure you have the, the proper factory manuals and that they're legible, they're understandable. Make sure everyone knows how the PM program works. And then on the odd time that you need to have a factory technician into your plant, don't just let him out there to fix and solve your problem. Make that a training experience. Involve every technician that you have and make them shadow that factory trained technician turning it into a learning experience for your entire maintenance team. So the next thing we're going to cover is, you know, really what should we do next? Uh, and we, you know, we say we because we work with you um, and we want to be involved in the process. Everybody needs to be involved in the process. Uh, I'd love to just say that we could throw some equipment at you and, you know, that solves the story and you know, that solves the problem. Uh, but it's really not just that. Uh, we need to take a look at the whole uh, entirety of the industry uh, and starting with the community. Um, 
you know, it's, it's just been lacking over the years, the education part of it. I know that a lot of people uh, have uh, learning centers at their MRFs or in the local area where they train, uh, you know, and educate uh, students. But there's a lot more people out there that are not getting the education. Uh, and I know that a lot of people have flyers on their website, the municipalities have it on their website, uh, but a lot of it is very confusing and outdated uh, and just very difficult to get. Um, you know, a lot of people don't use the internet very well. Uh, you know, what I would like to see really is, you know, something more in the face, you know, maybe even on TV, uh, but educating the community. The next step of it is municipalities and processors working together, uh, you know, as a, a, on one team uh, to attack this. The next thing we're going to talk about will be uh, retrofits. So this is where uh, Van Dyke and the other equipment suppliers come into play, uh, but we'll get to that. So the first thing on educating community is the picture on the screen right now is an example of dual stream. You have bottles and cans in one bin and paper in the other, trash in the other. Well, what happened? What happened here? We took both of those bins, the paper in one bin, the containers in the other, we put it in one bin, that's still really all we want, but all of a sudden it just got way too confusing. Uh, you know, it, it obviously wasn't just, you know, the fact that we put it into one bin, but there are also a lot more items out there, um, you know, a lot of different types of packaging that's just confusing to people, but something happened in here. I, I, would, I would also, argue that if you look closely at this picture it's pretty telling the bins is how dual stream was collected and when those bins became 90 gallon carts with lids on them anything could be put into those 90 gallon carts the lid closed and no longer were your neighbors even policing what you were putting in the recycling bin no one really knew what was going in your recycling bin and that could be mistake recycling like your food waste could go in there or just bags of trash or it could be the wish recycling that you talked about earlier but there was no kind of self-policing and then with the with the 90 gallon carts came the automated trucks so even the collectors weren't totally seeing what was going into the bin and i think that's been a big factor yeah that's a very good point mark so you know Today, if you wanted to find out, you know, what you're supposed to do with recycling, type in, after this webinar, recycling guidelines or recycling rules or uh, recycling charts. I typed in recycling guidelines, and this is what comes up. Just the complexity of information. I mean, there's so much information out there about what the guidelines are for recycling that it's just, it's too much. And that's why it just goes to the wish recycling, where people just say, well, you know, it's just, there's just so much information out there and there's so many different items, I just can't really tell, so let's just throw it in the bin. But what we really have to do is just don't make it so complicated. Uh, you know, we just have to keep it simple, you know, just plain and simple. What do we really want for these people or our consumers and our clients to be putting in the bin, delivering to our systems? What do we really want? We want paper and we want containers. That's really all we want. If you go back to the dual stream model, that's all we were asking for was put paper in this bin, put containers in this bin. Uh, and somewhere along the line, and not really sure exactly what it was, maybe some of the stuff that I talked about, maybe some of the stuff that Mark talked about, it just got confusing. Uh, and now, you know, it's just, it's way too complex, uh, you know, for people to really understand what items are supposed to go in. But if there's anything I can say is, you know, just try to keep it simple. Look at the program that uh, either you have out there or uh, your haulers are, have out there, your processors have out there, and, and look up the list of, of the recyclable materials that they're telling their consumers and their clients to put in the bin. Uh, you actually might be surprised and, that they're putting things in there that aren't supposed to be in there. And when was the last time a follow-up letter or announcement went out to kind of update what's supposed to go in and what was not supposed to go in? I've had my bin at my house for a decade and never gotten a piece of mail about what's allowed in and what's allowed not allowed in. It's crazy. So how do we do this? Well. Um, Look, I'm, I know we are talking to a cross-section of people in our industry right now on this webinar, 
uh, and that's processors, haulers, consultants, equipment suppliers, but I, I expect there's some municipalities as well. Um, and I would just want municipalities and processors to realize this is a long-term partnership and for a long-term partnership to work, you have to work together uh, as a team or the, it's possible the program goes away altogether. So um, I know there might be a, a school of thought to, by the municipality to say, well, we have a contract and they have to honor it. And I get that. Um, but things have dramatically changed um, and maybe some different things need to be re-looked at uh, and there needs to be some coming together and meeting of the minds, uh, including um, more money spent on education by the municipalities. Maybe there's penalties at the curb, maybe a joint program for penalties at the curb for um, people that are not compliant with what's uh, involved in putting in what's in and what's not in the system. Um, maybe there's sharing in the cost to improve a facility. Maybe you're revisiting your contracts to make it to where it's um, beneficial moving forward for both parties. Really, as Adam said just a second ago, it's about working together to simplify the program. Cardboard, paper, bottles, and cans. That makes even the systems that are 15 years old able to process and make a sellable product. It's really where we're at right now. So in kind of summary, best practices for MRFs, we touched on uh, a lot today about community education, and that is a, that's a number one priority. Um, and I think it really, number two, changes to what is accepted in your specific program really need to be looked at. Um, Adam, you want to take number three? Yeah, you know, uh, we didn't really talk about it, but uh, a really key point uh, for everybody uh, to think about, the processors, uh, run the system at the rated capacity, um, or, you know, maybe even today just slightly slower. Uh, but what we see a lot around the country is, you know, say you have a 20 ton per hour system, uh, we're seeing people run it, you know, upwards of 25% above capacity. So, you know, running a 20 ton an hour system at 25 tons an hour, but then they have a significant amount of downtime, uh, you know, caused by mechanical failure or jams. And then their average uh, throughput ends up being 18 tons an hour. So they not only incurred, uh, you know, significant amount of downtime, they had damages to the equipment uh, and their throughput, you know, their average throughput was lower. So they didn't process as much material. So what we try to tell folks is maybe even just do a study in your own system run at the rated capacity or lower capacity and see what your uptime average ends up being and see at the end of the week or at the end of the month how much material you processed and you might be shocked to find that you process more and you had less downtime and less mechanical failure yeah the, look, the next two we can't stress enough and that's proactive maintenance programs with routine star disc replacement routine lamp and um, valve uh, replacements. Number five, training. Never stop training or cross training. It's not just a check the box, we did it, but it's an ongoing continual thing. And the last thing, um, we are equipment suppliers and we're just going to touch on a little bit of what's out there technology wise to kind of combat some of the things we've been talking about, which includes a new screen that would take the place of a fiber screen or an ONP screen, and that's a non-wrapping screen. So it utilizes large diameter shafts that don't allow bags to wrap around. So cleaning time is reduced uh, instead of the two and three and four hours of cleaning that you see and hear of at a MRF. It's reduced to five or 10 minutes a shift uh, to cut the big stuff off. So if you look at the picture, the picture on the left, is that Dallas system that we referenced earlier with the four and a half percent film bag? This is an after after a six hour run. This is uh, what the screen looks like. And on the right, this is a system in San Francisco with 60 hours of running. 
uh, without cleaning. So it's dramatic. Um, and we think, based on a couple small retrofits that we've done, it's a really big positive impact. We've taken an older system and just made one change, just changed the top deck screen to be a non-wrapping. And it has been major beneficial to these facilities. Uh, increased production, increased uptime, uh, minimal cleaning, quality has been improved. So a lot of positives when you longer change to a non-wrapping screen. Too? Seen longer starlight uh, because you don't have the wrapping on there. Also, two-piece stars when they do have to change stars, uh, really convenient. So uh, definitely something beneficial, as Mark mentioned. And the next thing to talk about is ballistic separators. With the changing stream, we feel that this is a va valuable tool to a single-stream sorting system. Uh, now we. We think it's very sensitive to throughput when you are talking about a high percentage of two-dimensional um, versus three-dimensional. So it is sensible, sensitive to throughput, but virtually no wrapping or a minimal amount of cleaning. Uh, and you get a really nice two-dimensional from three-dimensional separation while getting that last bit of fines out. Um, the ballistic separator is a really nice piece of equipment to add to a sorting system. Uh, next is uh, optical sorters. Look, optical sorters have been in MRFs for 15 years sorting uh, all different types of plastics, primarily PET. Um, our company's had a lot of experience with sorting uh, fiber going back to 2004, uh, but it has been a uh, a large focus recently on cleaning up paper to make it um, to a high um, specification to an end market such as China. Um, talk a little bit about two different types. One would be negative sorting of paper. So in essence, the material conveys down the belt, the optical sorter recognizes everything on the belt and makes a sorting decision to eject outthrows and prohibitives. So it's ejecting outthrows and prohibitives and letting the paper, the mixed paper, drop negatively. So that is what negative sorting is. Um, it's making a sorting decision to eject the brown, which is the outthrow, and the non-paper, which is the prohibitives. We also get a lot of requests for positive sorting. Uh, this makes a, um, a cleaner paper. Um, but there's other things that you have to take into consideration with that. Positive ejecting is material conveying down the belt. It's recognizing everything and it's ejecting the paper only positively and letting the outros and the prohibitives fall off negative off the belt. Yeah, Mark, and if I can just add here, um, you know, one of the benefits of an optical sorter is uh, its ability to make smart decisions. Uh, it's able to, uh, unlike a screen, uh, tell the difference between, um, you know, uh, paper and flattened containers like PET and aluminum. Uh, it's able to sort out both 2D and 3D dimensional paper, uh, can tell the difference between regular newspaper and uh, OCC or your white paper, your SOP. Uh, so it's a really intelligent to see machine uh, making, you know, smart decisions. Uh, and then it's also able to adapt, uh, you know, as the stream continues to change, uh, you can change the programming on it. And so it's not just as simple as, uh, you know, changing the angle on your screens or the speeds of your shafts. Uh, you're changing software, you're changing programs. So this is definitely a piece of technology that we see uh, being utilized more in the systems uh, to make smarter decisions and then to be able to just simply handle the changing stream. Yeah, a couple things to add. It, it can do 500 to 1,000 picks per minute versus what you see here, a robot, uh, which is a nice piece to a puzzle. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz and talk about robots lately that they could save the day for the China effect. We as a company are not sure of that. We do see robots as this piece to the puzzle, um, but 
uh, it's still about preparing the material. So whether it's an optical sorter or a robot, uh, the material needs to be prepared, homogenized, somewhat singulated on a belt, and conveyed uniformly to uh, to the recognition recognition technology. A robot can do 40 to 60 picks a minute. An optical sorter can do 500 to 1,000 and on up picks per minute. Um, there is still a place for a robot, uh, possibly where there's high labor rates. Um, you could see one going as a quality control position on a container line or maybe the end of line uh, recovery of recyclables out of a residue line. Um, but yeah, it's all about what makes sense, Mark. You know, it, it, what makes sense to that particular plant uh, in that particular area of the country and what their goals are. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, um, you know, depending on where it is in the system, depending on the volume uh, that's, in the, that's in the system, you know, if you put in a robot in a 30 ton an hour plant to sort PET, uh, you're gonna be getting, you know, the 50 or 60 picks a minute uh, of PET. Uh, so you're going to end up needing, you know, 10 robots to do all the picks where you could put in an optical sorter. But what it could do is it could quality control that PET. Uh, you know, there's options there for that. So, but it has to make sense for you. So you have to go through uh, the economics of it, um, you know, what it's going to take to integrate it to the system, and then, you know, what your ultimate goals are for that piece of equipment. Yeah, as, as we're transitioning, just one other final note. Look, there's other solutions that are less technical. Um, we have customers that are looking to add a new bunker to just be able to make two different grades of paper uh, because all of their paper goes into one bunker after it goes across three different separation devices, which was fine for the last 10 years, but now they, they want to have some flexibility about the different grades of paper they're making. So there's also little projects that are a little bit more on the low tech side. So Kind of wrapping things up, Van Dyke um, has several up and coming projects that are utilizing a lot of this technology we've been talking about or equipment that would go into quote unquote the MRF of the future. Now, the first one we'll mention, and there's a picture of it, and that's our test center. We're putting a test center in Norwalk, Connecticut, and um, it's, it's complete, uh, going through its final phases. Um, feel free to consider touring it. This is for you. Everyone on this webinar would be invited to um, bring a sample of material. You could uh, test out what its recovery is, what its purity is. There's multiple sensor-based units. There's ballistic separator. There's screens. So you can really get a feel for your specific material before you make uh, an equipment uh, selection. Now, the next uh, one to talk about is a minimal labor system that's being um, installed later this year that utilizes a lot of different technologies, including um, light, heavy density separation, uh, primarily to try to minimize uh, the amount of sorting labor on a system. Next one's a project Adam's working on specifically. Uh, it involves positively sorting paper to make really clean paper and to sort it into multiple, three different uh, cuts, three different bunkers to make three different products to possibly market to three different customers. Uh, and the last one's a recovery system that we are working on for flexible packaging, uh, and we're really excited about that. So we've got four different projects. Uh, to look forward to uh, coming up um, the rest of this year. So as we go to wrap up, um, I just want to uh, thank you very much for joining us today and just let you know that we do have a full team scattered all over North America that can give a full assessment on your system and work with you on what your goals are and what your challenges are. I would just recommend to anyone uh, to reach out to your equipment suppliers like us, uh, but there's obviously others out there. Uh, share what your issues are, what your goals are, um, and let the equipment suppliers come up with solutions that meet your goals and over overcome 
some of these challenges that we've talked through today. But again, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, listen today, and we really appreciate it. Thank you both Mark and Adam for that wonderful presentation. Before we sign off, I'd like to thank our presenters as well as our sponsor, Van Dyke Recycling Solutions. And while we don't have time today to conduct a live Q&A, just want to remind you all that all of the questions submitted during this webinar will be answered at a later date. I'd also like to remind you that the webcast on-demand version will be available on the Waste360 website within the next 48 hours and will be available for one year. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful remainder of your day.